Okay, um, so today we're going to go more deeply into the endogenous money approach. And feel free to stop me anytime. If you have a question, it's impossible for me to know how much of this you've already covered because I don't know your curriculum. Uh, so if there's anything you don't understand, just stop me and I'll go over it. As I said uh, yesterday, the endogenous money approach we consider to be part of what became modern money theory. It's actually where I began. Uh, virtually everything I'm going to present today I did in my dissertation uh, and beginning in 1986. And that was published as a book in 1990, Money and Credit and Capitalist Economies. And um, at the time, it was um, considered to be very crazy uh, by the mainstream. It was picked up pretty quickly by post-Keynesians in America and Britain, and then sort of spread around the world among post-Keynesians. Um, in the past 20 years, even the mainstream started catching on. And about 10 years ago, I think that it pretty much took over the mainstream, too. One of the reasons I had you read the um, article by Sheard, which is written for a, a general audience, um, is just to show you that, you know, here's somebody who's writing for the mainstream financial markets type of people, not academics, and he's explaining exactly what I'm going to be talking about today. So that just shows you how widespread the, the agreement is now that this is correct. Okay? Uh, I think some of the textbooks might still teach the exogenous money approach and the money multiplier, but I can tell you central banks no longer uh, view it that way at all in the developed world. Developing world, maybe it's still uh, somewhat controversial, but in the developed world, central bankers all accept this too. So anyway, let's uh, very quickly Um, review the conventional approach. I had a slide almost identical to this one last night. Um, the money supply is supposed to be exogenous in a particular sense of that term. Uh, I had you read, read Desai because he points out that it actually it's more complicated than what most people had believed. This is the control sense. It's exogenous in the control sense that central banks should be able to control the money supply, okay? Um, and they do that through the deposit multiplier. They only directly control the quantity of reserves. They don't directly control the money that is created by the private banking system. But if the money multiplier is relatively stable, then by controlling reserves, they control the total quantity of money created, okay? This was pretty much accepted by both monetarists and by so-called Keynesians, the Keynesians of the textbooks, the Paul Samuelson and James Tobin type of Keynesians. The only um, debate was over whether the money multiplier is stable. If the money multiplier is not stable, then controlling the quantity of reserves really won't allow you to control the money supply. And so there was a bit of a controversy about whether that money multiplier would be stable. Over time, there were several papers uh, that purported to empirically demonstrate that the money multiplier is stable. Okay. Bruner uh, had a paper in 1968. He's actually, the, as far as we know, the one who coined the term monetarism. So we all associate it with Milton Friedman, but it actually was Carl Bruner who came up with the term. And in this 1968 paper, he purported to show that the money multiplier is stable. Later, I think it's in 1981 or 82, someone named Baltensperger showed, uh, again, that the money multiplier actually is very stable. And the variation of it is so small, it's easy for the central bank to offset that 
by varying the quantity of reserves. So the argument is that they could um, target reserves and that would allow them to control, control the money supply. In uh, the early 80s, both the United States and the UK attempted to implement Friedman's money growth rate rule. In both countries, as well as in Europe, uh, and almost certainly in Brazil, there was high inflation. And the uh, Keynesians didn't know what to do about it because it came with high inflation. So to fight high, uh, I mean high unemployment, to fight high inflation, you need to slow down the economy using mostly fiscal policy because Keynesians believe fiscal policy is more powerful. But if you have high unemployment, you need to stimulate the economy. Okay, so you need expansive fiscal policy. So you couldn't possibly do both at the same time, so they were at a loss what to do about stagflation. And so the central banks of uh, Britain and the US decided, well, we can't use fiscal policy, let's use monetary policy. So what we're gonna do is bring down the rate of growth of the money supply to very low levels like 4% per year. This is what Friedman had always recommended. They tried to do it. They could not hit their money targets. And the rate of growth of money supply became completely disconnected from the rate of inflation. Okay, so in the United States, uh, they're supposed to be bringing down the rate of growth of money supply to about 4%. What actually happened is it shot up to 16% per year. Now, 16% rate of growth of money supply should have led to very high inflation, but actually inflation started coming down. Okay, so we were getting explosive growth in money supply, inflation coming down, and the central bank saying, for whatever reason, we don't understand it, we can't hit our money targets. So they abandoned them. So that was the end of monetarism, okay? As a practical matter, they said, we're not gonna try to target the money supply anymore. There was still some lip service for another decade in the US. They would still announce money targets, but they wouldn't try to hit them. And then finally, by the 1990s, they stopped announcing money targets, said we don't do that anymore, we target the interest rate. Okay, so that was the end of that um, story. What is money? I already went through that uh, last night, so I won't go through that again. All right, Desai uh, points out that there are uh, two uh, different definitions of endogeneity, and then I'm gonna add a third one. Um, in the theoretical sense, money supply and money demand cannot be independent because even if the central banks are controlling the money supply, it's not likely that they completely ignore money demand. So if they respond at all to changes of money demand, then the money supply is endogenous. Okay? Even if they're controlling it, it's still endogenous in a theoretical sense. The control sense is what most people have been talking about anyway. They really weren't talking about theoretical endogeneity. They were talking about uh, exogeneity in the control sense. Okay? And of course, as I said, we've given that up anyway. There's a, a third sense that's related to the theoretical sense, but it's uh, in the empirical sense. Um, Cooley and Leroy wrote a very nice article on trying to identify a money demand curve. Okay? And they uh, argued that it's actually going to be impossible to do that. Okay? Actually, you know what, I, it will be useful if I draw something over here on the board. I thought I wouldn't move, but no it's, it's easier to explain this if I show you in a picture. Okay, take any market. I assume you studied uh, de demand supply curves, unfortunately. It's complete nonsense. I don't teach them, okay? But you got price and you have quantity. Now in the real world, obviously you never observe a demand curve. You never observe a supply curve. What you observe is, let's just say, 
These are three different years. Okay? 2000, 2001, 2002. You observe dots. That's all you observe. Okay? Now, you're all looking at this, and I know what you think you see. Okay? You think you see a demand curve. Okay? It's possible that you do. Okay? But you never really see that. All you see is the dots. Okay? To identify what the demand curve looks like, you have to know what happened to the supply. You're all imagining that what happened was supply shifted. Okay? But we don't know that to be true. It could have been any combination. Maybe actually they look like this. Both shifted every time. You don't know. What we need to do is try to identify the demand curve. Okay? Now for um, basically uh, since the late 50s until about 1990, there were hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of academic papers and PhD dissertations written on the money demand curve. It was probably the most important issue in macroeconomics. When I was a graduate student, every macroeconomics dissertation was estimating a money demand function. Every one of them. Okay? Once they ran out of ideas for estimating money demand functions for the United States and the UK, then they started going to Sri Lanka. Okay? And now I am a co-editor of the JBA. We still will occasionally get one a money demand uh, empirical study for you know, uh, a small developing nation. Okay? It's not done anymore because Cooley and Leroy showed why it's complete nonsense. All right? The only way to identify the money demand function is we have to have a variable that will shift the money supply function without shifting the money demand function. That's how you can identify it. So they look at all the possible variables that you think might shift the money supply function, but not shift the money demand function. And if you could find that variable, you would be able to identify the money demand function, and then you could settle the debate between monetarists and Keynesians on what it looks like. Okay? The most obvious one is bank reserves. Because you would think that uh, reserves shift the money supply function, but they wouldn't shift the money demand function. Okay? So central banks change reserves supposedly to change the money supply. But there's no reason to think that money demand will change because reserves have changed. Right? Reserves are under the control of the central bank. You demand money for, uh, to satisfy those three functions. Why would changing the supply reserves affect your money demand? Shouldn't. So it seems like that's the variable you could use. But they argue, no, of course not. You can't use that because that would be true only if the central bank never changed reserves in response to a change in money demand. But there's no reason to believe that. They change reserves in response to changes in money demand. Okay? Because one of the things, no matter what Friedman advised, they pay attention to is the interest rate. Okay? So in the past, we're sure that they changed reserves in response to shifts of money demand. So th that is not independent of the money demand function, so there's no way you can identify the um, money demand function, okay? So that's the empirical sense. Um, you can't believe any of the empirical studies. Now, they're focused on this particular question, but of course it's applicable everywhere. Okay? It, it's the fundamental problem with demand and supply approaches to um, uh, macroeconomics, at least. Uh, it's very unlikely that demand and supply are independent. If you've read the general theory, you know that this was one of the, this was the issue in uh, chapter two. The labor demand and labor supply functions cannot be independent. That was Keynes's argument. They can't be independent. 
And um, then later he does the same thing with um, the uh, uh, investment saving relation. And the only diagram in the book he demonstrates that they're going to be interdependent, they can't be independent. All right, so that's the um, definitions of the terms. Uh, I'll talk a bit about Keynes' approach to money because um, unfortunately, um, there's some ambiguity. In the treaties on money, Keynes says, the, well, after he wrote the Treatise on Money, he says, I was a quantity theorist when I wrote the Treatise on Money. Okay. He said that uh, the, it was only after he started writing the general theory that he abandoned the quantity theory and adopted the liquidity preference theory um, approach to money. However, if you read the two volumes of the treaties, this is where he really gets into the monetary details of how banks create money. And when you read that, you don't see central bank controlling the money supply, okay? Um, which is fundamental to the quantity theory. Now, there is an obvious huge difference between the treaties and the um, general theory, and that is the theory of effective demand. In the uh, treaties, like all the, what do you call, classical economists, and the, today we would say the neoclassical economists, um, is that they had no theory of output and employment as a whole, and he didn't in the treaties either. He took that as given. Okay? So in that sense, he was following the same methodology that the neoclassical economists followed. And in the general theory, he abandoned that. Okay? But uh, he said he was a quantity theorist. Um, I don't think that that's quite accurate. Then in the general theory, um, he actually seems to have two different approaches to money. There are many places in the general theory where it seems like he is adopting exogenous money with the central bank controlling the money supply. Then there are many other places where it seems like he has an endogenous money approach. Uh, Vicki Chick, probably some of you uh, have read some of her work, very well known post Keynesian, went through the general theory and you know, listed every time where it sounded like exogenous money, every time where it sounded like endogenous money, and it's just about equal. Okay. Um, and when you read chapter 13 and chapter 15 in the general theory, it sounds like he's talking about a vertical money supply curve, which would be exogenous money. The central bank sets the uh, quantity of money. And then that faces a money demand curve. So the central bank determines the quantity of money, and money demand just determines the interest rate. And this, uh, he doesn't do a diagram, but when you're reading it, you can see the diagram that Hicks uses to get the LM curve. Okay. It really does sound like Hicks is accurately representing Keynes's money theory that's presented in chapters 13 and 15. Now, there's a whole story, I wasn't around, uh, but uh, Craigle uh, did his dissertation under Robinson, and he talks about this, um, that he was pushed by some of the younger people in the circus. He just put everything in demand and supply terms. That's easy for economists to understand. And that seems to be what he did in those two chapters. So it sounds like he's talking about a fixed money supply and a downward sloping money demand curve, and those two things determine the rate of interest. Then there's a single rate of interest determined in the money market that we weigh against the marginal efficiency of capital to get the quantity of investment. So you also sort of get the IS, uh, sorry, the IS curve uh, out of that explication. Okay. Then he has chapter 17. 
Chapter 17 is completely different. It's a completely different explanation. Okay. It is really a liquidity preference theory of the rate of interest. Instead of having a single interest rate determined by money demand and money supply, he has a different interest rate for anything you can hold through time. So he actually starts off the chapter, for those who read the uh, chapter 17, most people skip it. Okay, Paul Krugman, I never bothered reading that one. Okay, because it is very difficult, and he starts off and he talks about a wheat rate of interest. Okay, the own rate of interest on wheat. And then he goes on, own rate of interest on copper. Anything you can hold through time. Physical commodities, but also financial assets, and capital equipment. Every one of those has its own rate of interest. And we can measure those own rates of interest in terms of the money rate of interest. And then he argues money has special properties. And that is why it makes sense to measure all of the interest rates in money terms instead of own rate terms. And it's a long, very complicated chapter, and it bears no relation at all to chapter 13 or 15. Okay? The um, post-Keynesians who are called fundamentalists, who include Davidson, uh, Minsky, Kregel, all argue that chapter 17 is the critical chapter. And it's the one that is left out of uh, most of the um, followers of Keynes, and in particular, all the ones who use ISL. Okay. So there was a huge problem in the general theory, presenting two, maybe even more than two, I focused on two, two different theories of money in the general theory, and it's confusing and very misleading. All right. Now, the reason why it's important is because of the, the future development of endogenous money theory. The chapters 13 and 15 seem to be exogenous money. Chapter 17, it's not exogenous money at all. It's not a story of money demand and money supply determining the interest rates. The interest rates are determined by Q minus C plus L, okay, the yield minus the carrying cost plus L, which is the reward uh, to liquidity, okay, the liquidity premium. He calls it a liquidity uh, premium theory of the rate of interest because that's the most important thing. It's subjective, it can vary a lot, it depends on your optimism and pessimism that will determine that whole spectrum of interest rates which then determines uh, what can be done. That is, what kind of capital investments can be undertaken which determines effective demand. That's why it's the critical chapter, all right? It's all about liquidity preference. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the early development of endogenous money by post-Keynesians focused on chapter 13 and 15, not on chapter 17. And so you have a, a whole bunch of um, uh, endogenous money people who argue that Keynes had an exogenous money approach. The liquidity preference theory of the rate of interest is based on exogenous money because they see that as behind the money demand curve that faces a fixed money supply curve. And therefore they want to throw out uh, liquidity preference theory. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the other, that, that is the horizontalists. The other um, attempt to make the uh, money supply endogenous began with uh, Paul Davidson in 1965 and then in his book, Money in the Real World, was to focus on the finance motive of Keynes. So after the general theory, uh, the general theory is uh, subject to critiques and Keynes responds to those critiques in some articles and also in letters. And uh, in uh, one of those papers, 
he argues that I uh, left out an important motive for holding money. The general theory has the transaction, the speculative and precautionary motives for holding money. Those are all in chapter 13 and 15, and they all became part of the Keynesian exposition of the textbooks. Keynes says, I forgot the finance motive, and it's the most important one, which is a little strange. He spent years writing the general theory, and he left out the most important reason why you want to hold money. So the finance motive. And the finance motive is uh, a motive to hold money in anticipation of spending. And he says, normally banks will meet that demand for money. So in other words, you plan to buy a car, <coughs> what do you do? You go to the bank and borrow money, and then you buy the car. Okay, that would seem to be what he's talking about. Or you wanna buy a machine. You go to the bank, you borrow money, you hold it to buy a machine. The finance motive, it sounds like it's a demand for loans. <coughs> So post Keynesian picked that up and said, well, see, he doesn't have exogenous money. This is clearly endogenous. People plan to spend, and banks will normally provide the finance, create the money so that they can spend. So there was a, a whole um, a group of post Keynesians who are using this kind of argument as the basis for an endogenous money that you can find. They're growing pretty much at the same time was another approach, the circuit approach, which was um, sort of a rediscovery of work of French economists in the 1920s that argued that um, we don't want to get into the kind of infinite regress arguments that I was talking about last night. If you're going to talk about the circular flow, you have to begin with money getting into the circular flow to finance spending. Okay? That clearly is an endogenous money. They begin with banks that create money in order to finance spending. So it sounds something like the finance mode. Okay? So that's another way you can get it. And then a bit later, we had the development of horizontalism. Uh, beginning in uh, around 1979, Basil Moore wrote an entry for the, um, uh, what's it called, the Guide to Post-Keynesian Economics, very important chapter of that book, where he begins to develop this approach that he eventually calls horizontalism in the 1988 book. So this is basically a story of the 80s, developing horizontalism. So, I'm going to first talk about the um, circuit approach, and then horizontalism, and some problems with horizontalism, and then uh, move on to uh, an approach that's informed by all of this, uh, but I think it's uh, not subject to some of the problems. So I presented this uh, yesterday. This is the typical textbook exposition in which the um, households provide savings to financial institutions that can then lend them out. Okay. And so the financial institutions are intermediaries. This is the typical way that they're presented by orthodoxy. Banks are intermediaries between savers and investors. Well, that doesn't tell you how the households got the money in the first place that they could lend to the bank so the banks could lend them on to investors. So this is what the um, circuit approach is reacting against. Graziani was one of the most important developers in Italy. It's called usually the French-Italian circuit approach. And um, he lays out uh, the basic principles of the circuit approach uh, beginning in 1980, paper, and then um, a book must have been in the early 90s, you know, a book called The Monetary Theory of Production. 
The theory of the monetary circuit rejects the approach that I started with last night. The barter story, Robinson Crusoe, and all that. Um, it focuses on the power of banks and firms. They, have, unlike um, the neo neoclassical approach, who is sovereign in the neoclassical approach? In microeconomics, what are you told? The consumer is sovereign. It's the consumer that has the power. The firms just respond. They don't have any power at all. So many buyers and so many sellers, nobody can influence the price. Okay, so that's what Graziani is rejecting. It begins with bank credit money. And traditionally, there was no state. So there's no state money. Uh, yesterday I was talking about state money. There's no state money in this world. They begin with banks. Um, after the rise of modern money theory, some of them started trying to put the state into it. Farghese and Secretia and Lavoie have all added the state, but traditionally it was not there. So they begin with bank money. Um, credit money is a token and a paper currency, but it's not just a promise to pay. Okay, so this is different from what I was saying yesterday, Minsky, anybody can create money. They don't accept that. Okay, it's special. If only a promise to pay is issued, that's not money because at the end of the period, a final payment is still needed. So if I write IOU, eventually I have to give you something different. I can't just give you another IOU. Okay? I have to give you a final means of payment in order to get, at, get out of debt, otherwise I'm still in debt. That is, a credit economy is not a monetary economy. If you read Schumpeter, you know that he makes this distinction between money uh, economies and credit economies. Money is a final means of payment. It cannot provide seniorage. Okay, seniorage is the idea uh, that's, that's based on this myth of uh, a commodity money. So the, the, I didn't f quite finish the barter story, how the government comes in uh, to that story. The idea is that originally the government issues uh, paper notes that are backed by gold. Uh, if you bring in 16 ounces of gold, the gov government uh, will coin 14 ounces of that for you and keep two ounces to coin for itself. That is what senior rich is. Okay? And when the government finally goes off gold and issues just paper money, senior rich reaches almost 100%. When they are co coining gold, they have to obtain gold. Okay, and so they're giving you 14 coins for your gold. So the seniorage is only the two coins they get. But when they go to a fiat money, they don't have to give you anything. They just issue paper money. It costs them essentially nothing to print. So seniorage reaches 100%. Okay, so I'm just explaining what he means by seniorage in case you don't uh, know what it is. It's all based on this myth. That is not the way the money system worked, ever. The senior ridge uh, was always very high. Uh, so, uh, what was it? it cannot provide senior ridge to anybody. You cannot use your own IOU to make payments. You have to use a third party IOU. Okay, uh, a first party IOU would be that I can make a payment with my own IOU. Uh, second party would be that um, I, what I was talking about yesterday. If you issue an IOU, I can make a payment to you with your own IOU. That's second party. Third party is I can't use your IOU. I have to use a third party. Say the bank. The bank's IOU to pay you. Okay, that's a third party. 
So for their, uh, their principles of money, the principles of their theory of money, it always has to be a third party IOU. And banks can never use their own IOUs to make payments. Money gets into the system largely through bank loans to finance the wage bill. WB means wage bill. So typically the circuit approach starts with a firm that wants to hire labor to begin production. And banks accommodate that by lending uh, to finance the wage bill. And if you um, have taken money in banking, uh, come across the real bills doctrine, this is similar to that idea. The creation of money is very closely tied to the production in the system. So money is being created to finance the wage bill, which then produces the goods and services that uh, the workers use to buy with their wages. Um, so firms can repay those loans when they sell the final output to the workers, recapturing the wages they paid, they can repay the loan. I'm gonna have a diagram in just a second. It's not clear in your mind, it will be. Um, the uh, problem is that workers might not spend all their wages. If they save any of their wages, firms cannot repay the loans. They can repay part of them, but uh, the amount that you save uh, leaves an equal amount of the loan that you cannot repay. So saving out of wages prevents them from retiring the loans. What firms then can do is try to sell you their own debt, sell you bonds, so corporate bonds. If you use your savings to buy the corporate bonds, the firms recapture your savings and they can repay the loans. So in a sense, the outstanding supply of bonds uh, is represents the loans that they had to repay by capturing your savings. If liquidity preference rises, some savings cannot be recaptured in bond sales. Okay, because liquidity preference is your preference to hold the deposits rather than hold the bonds. So liquidity preference will determine how many of the bonds will have to be bought by the banking system in order for the firms to repay their loans. So here's a simple model. If we had uh, one bank, one firm, one household, this is what it would look like. The bank at the top lends deposits to the firm uh, in the early models, it was banknotes, but uh, generally banks don't issue notes anymore, okay? largely because governments didn't want to compete with banks, and so they taxed them. Put a big enough tax on banknotes, and the banks stopped issuing. Or you just outright uh, ban them. So now it's deposits. Okay? It doesn't uh, really matter for the story which one it is. So the bank lends deposits to the firm. Now, this is clearly endogenous money. Okay. Can they run out of deposits to lend to the firm? No, they can't run out. Okay. Today, it's just keystrokes. Keystroke credits to the deposit account of the firm. They can't run out. The um, firm then uses those deposits or notes to pay wages to the households, so that's the second arrow. The households are, supply the workers, they produce the output, and uh, then they buy the output from the firm. So the deposits are, of the households are debited, and the deposits of the firm are credited. 
then the firm can repay the loan to the bank. Okay, so this is a circuit of the deposits created by the bank when they make a loan, and then finally destroyed, <coughs> marked off the deposit account of the firm when the loan is repaid. All right. If households don't save, then if firms borrowed a hundred, paid a hundred in wages, sold the output for a hundred, they can repay the loan of a hundred, right? If households save 10, they can only repay 90. So that's what the Razzianis are. If there's any saving at all, the firms can't repay their loans. So you know, what the firms can do is try to capture the savings by selling bonds. So that's what he said. So that's one potential problem. Second potential problem, the firms cannot pay any interest on the loans. If they borrowed a hundred, they can only repay a hundred because they can't pay more wages than a hundred. Households can't spend more than their wages, a hundred. The firm's revenue can't be more than a hundred. So there's no way they can pay interest. All right? So this is a problem. So it took, you know, years to figure out possible solutions to that kind of a problem. And one way to do it is, well, the bank pays interest on the deposits. So if they pay 10% interest on deposits, some of the time the deposits are held by the firm, some of the time the deposits are held by the household. Each of them are, are getting interest. So the firm actually could spend more than 100. The household could spend more than 100. So the firm can pay more than 100 and pay interest. Okay, well, the problem with that is they can't pay more in interest than the banks paid out. So, for example, the bank is charging 10% and it receives 10%, the bank can't make any profits. That's a problem. Okay, and then the final problem is, what firm wants to pay 100 in wages and receive 100 in revenue? A not-for-profit firm. There's no profits. Okay, so that, uh, that debate actually still continues. How are you going to solve that one? Okay, well, there's one easy way you say, oh, there's a government. And the government buys part of the output. So the firm can sell the output for 110, not 100. And the advantage of throwing the government into the model is governments don't have to make profits. See, firms have to make profits. Governments don't. So if you add another sector and you say it's a not-for-profit one, like the government, you can earn profits. You can sell it to foreigners. Okay, so exports could be the source of your profits. You can add an, a whole other circuit that is not about producing consumer goods, but it's about producing investment goods. The workers in the investment sector will want to buy some of this output, and that will allow for profits in this circuit. If you've heard of the Koleski equation, that's what the Kolesky equation is. It's the workers in the investment sector buy some of the consumption output. That creates profits here. You could have, well, you say, you know, this isn't realistic because there's only one firm. There's only one little circuit here. The reality is we have thousands of firms. There are thousands of circuits, and they're all different lengths of time. Some circuits might last a week. Some circuits last a month. Some circuits last a year. And so with different timing, you could have profits coming in. Okay, so there are lots of other ways uh, to try to figure out how you get profits in this. All right. Um, the other problem here is, that's unrealistic is there's only one bank. So that is fairly easy to resolve, and uh, Graziani was getting at this, that uh, the bank can't retire its own IOUs using its own IOUs. And so what he's referring to is when we get to a two-bank system. So now bank one is lending to the firm. The firm pays wages. But the household doesn't use bank one. 
they use bank two. So when bank two receives the firm's check, they send it to bank one and they say, we want to be paid. And we will not accept your IOU. Okay? Your check is your IOU already. We want you to pay us in a third party IOU. Who's the third party? The central bank. We want to be paid in the central bank's IOU. Okay? So that's how you introduce the central bank. The central bank then will lend reserves to bank one so it can make the payment to bank two. Okay? So bank two gets a credit of reserves. Of course, that'll be reversed later. When the, the household buys the output, now the check goes the other way. The reserves here are credited, the reserves here are debited, and this firm then, I mean this bank, can then repay the loan to the central bank. Okay, so this is how they put central banks in. Uh, just like the, the private banks can't run out of deposits, there's no limit to their ability to loan, to create money. The central bank can never run out of reserves. It can always create all the reserves necessary to allow the banks to clear their accounts with one another. Right. So we have um, both endogenous money in the sense demand deposits are completely endogenous, determined by the bank's willingness to lend to firms who want to borrow to pay the wage bill, and also the supply of reserves is endogenous. Central bank can't run out, it can always create reserves to lend to the banks that want to borrow them. So both of those are endogenous. Um, so to summarize the endogenous money approach, the shorthand terminology that developed is that loans make deposits. Not in a metaphysical sense, but in the sense that the deposits are created in loans. The deposits of the private banks are created when they make loans to firms in the simple model here. We didn't have any consumer debt, we only had firm debt. Okay. Uh, if we added consumer debt, it would be the same story. When the banks make loans to uh, consumers, they are endogenously creating deposits. Um, another thing about uh, endogenous money is that uh, it's arguing you need to begin with money. You have to start your story with the money that funds the spending. And we're starting with production in the circuit approach. Um, so, it's uh, uh, whether you do the Marx or the Keynes, it's an MCM prime. You start with money, you produce the commodities to sell for more money. Or Keynes's uh, monetary theory of production, which was the, the working title of the general theory. If you, you can read the drafts of the general theory, and it's very interesting because it they were very close to uh, Marx's explication, much clearer than the general theory, and virtually completely dropped for what became the general theory. Again, why is that? It seems to be the influence of the circus, the young people that Keynes was working with, and they were reading his drafts and they didn't like it. And so he completely switched uh, the, uh, the way that he was presenting that, and uh, there's hardly any of it left in the general theory. Um, the other thing is that this approach emphasizes money as a flow that's being created to finance spending, rather than money as a stock, the way that it is treated in the vertical money supply curve. Money stock. Focus on uh, the uh, motives for holding money. 
That is looking at money as a stock. Now, the finance motive was a step in the direction of looking at money as a flow, a flow of finance. Rather than something you hold, it's something you spend. So it's related to the spending that you plan to undertake. The money stock is a residual. If we go back to this diagram, uh, if you looked at money supply data, in the United States, uh, the FDIC reports, let's say, M1, the narrow measure of the money supply. Uh, it, this used to be true. I have to admit, I haven't looked at it for almost 40 years. I don't think it's changed. The third Wednesday of the month. So the third Wednesday of the month, they make an estimate of what M1 is. Okay? Now, we've got these circuits, right? So the, the banks creating money, uh, flowing to households, eventually the money being, the loans being repaid. Okay? But on the third Wednesday of the month, we total up all the money that exists. What does that represent? It represents loans that have been created but not repaid. That's what it is. Okay, because all of the deposits out there have been created in loans. But they haven't been repaid yet. Is that a very interesting number? Does it tell you anything about causation? Is it directly related to something like national income or national GDP? Maybe not. Maybe it's completely uninteresting. And its relation to GDP is a coincidence of hundreds of thousands of factors. Okay. How many circuits have begun? How many circuits have closed? How many uh, new circuits have been opened? What is the average length of time of the circuits? Is that growing or shrinking? All of those things will go into determining how many loans have been made but not retired by the Wednesday of the third week. So for monetarists, the money supply is everything, right? Their whole theory was based on the quantity of money. That is the quantity theory of money. It's supposed to be the most important variable. For post-Keynesians, the money supply is completely uninteresting because it's just a residual. What's interesting is this, when the loans are made. Okay, not the outstanding quantity of loans. Because loans are important because they can finance spending, which is what we're interested in. We're not interested in the quantity of loans that haven't been repaid yet, you know, until we get into things like financial instability, outstanding debt that can't be repaid. Okay, that's interesting. But money supply by itself is not. So that's why I'm saying it's just a residual. Any correlation between income and money is reverse causation. Okay? It's not money that causes the spending. It's true, oops. It's true that if this firm wants to spend, it's got to get the loan. But it's not getting the loan that causes them to want to spend. They want to spend, they want to hire labor, so they go to the bank and get a loan. So it's necessary for them to get the loan, but it's not that they woke up some morning and found out, oh, we got money. What a surprise. Let's go spend it. That's the monitor story. That's what Friedman says. When he asked Friedman, how does money get into the economy? You all know, remember what he said. Assume it came from helicopters. Okay, so you literally wake up in the morning, you find a bag of money in the backyard, and you say, let's go spend it. That's his story which is complete nonsense. 
That's not how money gets into the economy. It gets into the economy because the firm wants to spend. And so they go to the bank and borrow. So it's a completely different causation, reverse causation. Now, post-Keynesians didn't, uh, weren't the first ones to come up with. Tobin has a very famous paper in post hoc and Dr. Hunter, where he argued that was possible. The correlation might be due to reverse causation. Post-Keynesians are going further. It is reverse causation. It has to be re reverse causation, because money never drops from helicopters. Um, in the uh, from in the fifties and the sixties, the velocity of money was fairly constant, and monetarists used that as proof they were right. Okay, there's a constant relationship between the money supply and spending. So if you control the money supply, you will be controlling spending. Caldor uh, and uh, others who worked with the Radcliffe Committee. And, that issued a report in 1959, all argue, no, that's just evidence of reverse causation. The constant velocity is just proof that um, the relation goes from income to money. And there's a pretty fixed relation between how much money you need to finance those circuits so constant velocity would occur. Uh, the problem was velocity became completely unhinged in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and you know, ever after, velocity is not stable at all, okay? Which is a problem for the monitors, the post can say, well, okay, fine, it's a residual, who cares, okay? Uh, it's just the outstanding quantity of loans that have been repaid, and there's no reason to think there will be a fixed relation to spending of that. Okay, finally, um, the development of horizontalism. Uh, Basil Moore's 88 book was called Horizontalists and Verticalists. The verticalists are the people who imagine the money supply is vertical, fixed by the central bank, and then money demand, which is called liquidity preference by the Keynesians, determines the interest rate. So that's the verticalist approach. In um, the orthodox approach, excess money leads to inflation. If too many of those helicopters are flying and dropping bags of money, and people wake up, find it, go out and spend, it's going to cause inflation. That's the idea. Um, in the non-orthodox, heterodox approaches, if you have more uh, credits to your demand deposit than you want, you don't run out and spend it. What you do is you buy financial assets. So if the, given your state of liquidity preference, you say, hey, I'm more liquid than I need to be, what are you going to do? Run out and buy commodities? No. You're going to buy financial assets. So it will uh, affect the interest rate. Or you say, oh, I can repay some of my loans. I've accumulated uh, $20,000 in my demand deposit. I don't need to hold that much for precautionary reasons, so I'm going to repay some of my credit card debt. So you repay loans instead of spending. Um, the second statement, so the first one is loans make deposits. The second statement is deposits make reserves. Again, it's not in a metaphysical sense. It's in the sense that Central bank operations are always defensive. They always accommodate. When that bank one needs reserves to make a payment to bank two, the central bank will always accommodate. Now, why do they do that? Horizontals have um, one answer, and then we can add a second one. And uh, I'll just quickly do the second one right now. We'll come back to it later. The second answer is, Central banks are extremely worried about the payment system. They don't want the payment system to break down. If they didn't supply reserves so that Bank One could um, make the payment for check clearing, the payment system would break down. Banks would stop accepting each other's checks. If the central bank wouldn't lend reserves, and credit their reserves, they would stop accepting other banks' checks. 
if you want par clearing of checks, the central bank has to accommodate the need for reserves. Okay? So, in fact, central banks always accommodate the demand for reserves. They don't refuse to supply reserves. Uh, some people will, will go on to talk about lender of last resort, but, but this is even more basic than lender of last resort. This is just making sure the payment system works. They will always uh, accommodate the demand. And I'll tell the same story as to uh, why they never bounce treasury checks. If the central bank starts bouncing treasury checks, your whole payment system is going to fall apart. Because if you can't trust a treasury check, you're not going to trust anybody's check. Um, so, that's story. But the, the reason given by the horizontalists is that central banks are targeting the interest rate. So now everyone accepts that, and central banks announce that they're targeting the interest rate. But you have to remember, when Basil Moore's writing this book, central banks denied that they're targeting the interest rate. Now, they really were, okay, but they denied it. They wanted uh, plausible deniability. Okay, why? because the population starts getting really mad when central banks raise interest rates. They didn't want to take the political heat. So they pretended that, oh no, we don't do that. Okay. Uh, now they all admit that that's what they did. Okay, and I'm sure you're all following the Fed. The Fed tells you two years in advance, right? Get ready, we're gonna start raising rates. Okay, get ready, get ready, get ready. They don't do it for a long, long time. But they warn you, and they make it very clear, they control it. Well, if you're going to control the interest rate, you have to supply the reserves the banks want. Because otherwise, they will drive the bank rate up. The bank rate is the rate they lend reserves to each other, which has become very important in, uh, in the past 50 years. 50 years ago, it wasn't very important. The interbank lending market wasn't very well developed but it's become very well developed. Okay, so if a bank is short reserves, first they go to the interbank market, called the Fed funds market in the US. As sort of a last resort, they will go to the Fed. Okay. So you would get pressure in the Fed funds market, drive the interest rate above the target. So the central bank would miss its interest rate target if it didn't supply the reserves the banks want. That's why they will always supply reserves. Um, this was Basil Moore's argument. In a mono-reserve pyramidal system, okay, pyramid means that, um, and I'm going to show you a pyramid a little bit later, but pyramidal reserve system means that uh, banks make payments to each other using the central bank's reserves. Okay, mono-reserve means there's only one supplier, the central bank. Um, in each country. The reserves are non-discretionary. They can't come from anywhere else. Okay, it's true you can borrow reserves from a bank that has more than they need, but they can't create reserves. So once all the um, uh, excess reserves have been eliminated, the only supply is the central bank. The central bank has to lend. Uh, Basil didn't really talk much about this at the time because we didn't envision uh, the changes that occurred after the global financial crisis. But there's an asymmetry. The central bank can always provide more reserves than the banks want. They can't provide less than the banks want. Okay? So, uh, after the global financial crisis, the, many of the central banks, ECB, the Fed, uh, and the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan, all adopted some form of quantitative easing. Quantitative easing meant that what they would do is pump trillions of extra dollars, yen, uh, euros, pounds, into the banking system. Reserves the banks didn't want. And buy up bonds government bonds, mortgage-backed securities, things like that. You can always supply more than they want, but the impact will be you drive the interest rate towards zero. So if you're happy with ZERP, zero interest rate policy, you can always supply more than they want. Now, we never envisioned central banks would operate that way, but they started doing 
Okay, now they're trying to figure out how to get out of it. Um, but they've got uh, the Fed, uh, I think it's still about three trillion of excess reserves in the banking system. How are they going to get them out? They're worried about it. Uh, but they can't reduce the quantity of reserves below what banks want. So finally, horizontalism poses that it's the interest rate that's exogenous. The central bank controls the interest rate. But the money supply is endogenous. So the picture looks like this. Money supply is horizontal. I, had, I didn't draw it, but you can imagine a vertical money supply. That would be orthodox. And when you read chapter 13 and 15 of the general theory, it seems like that's what Keynes was assuming to. Um, so the central bank has no control over the money supply. The quantity is determined by money demand. And money demand in the horizontalist model is, is really the demand for loans. That's what money demand is. It's the demand for loans. So that will determine the interest rate. Okay, here, this is the United States. The interest rate um, that uh, banks set is a markup over the Fed funds rate. So the Fed funds rate is really the Fed's target. Okay. If that's 1%, obviously banks are not going to create money at 1% interest because they need profit. So if they have to pay 1% to get reserves, they're going to add a markup in order to make a loan. So the markup covers their business costs and allows profits for the banks. How much is the markup? It's probably at least four percentage points on deposits and probably more like six percentage points on loans. They need about four percent to cover the costs of managing deposit accounts. Possibly it's gone down with technological advance, but probably not very much. So uh, banks um, have to cover those costs, and then loans, of course, there's also the, uh, the loan officer costs and the default risk. So we gotta cover that. So they add that markup. Now, this is simpler. If you read Basil Moore's book, He'll have a number of diagrams that, that get more and more complicated. He talks about um, two inputs and two outputs in the for-profit banking uh, sector. The uh, inputs to the banking um, business are the deposits. Okay, So they're creating them, but the problem is that when a bank makes a loan, that deposit is probably going to end up in another bank. Just like in my example, bank one created the loan for the firm, but the deposit ends up in bank two. So bank one now has to sort of refinance its position in the loan. They've got to attract a deposit, otherwise they have to go to the Fed and borrow. They don't want to do that. Okay? They would rather issue another deposit. So there's a, a cost of issuing deposits. Retail deposits would be your local bank, the local community goes to that bank. That's the retail market. In the retail market, uh, banks are price setters. Okay? They can probably pay you a slightly lower deposit rate, interest rate on deposits, because you have the convenience of going to your local bank. If it's a... Uh, um, a uh, national bank that might not have branches in your community, they can get away with paying you a lower interest rate. So we're saying that there's some pricing power in the retail market. The wholesale market would be like certificates of deposit. I assume that you have these things. They would, in the old days, they were advertised in the Wall Street Journal. Okay. If you uh, have $100,000 and you want to buy a CD, uh, that market is uh, price taker and quantity set, okay? because that's a national market, 
the individual bank really has no control over that. They've got to compete with everyone else who is selling hundred thousand dollars savings. Okay. Then in the output market, the output is the loans. We have the same uh, sort of uh, local monopoly power. The um, local bank has some uh, pricing power over the retail rates. Um, and uh, in the wholesale market, they don't. Okay. So if you're, uh, I don't know, IBM and you can shop around, okay, you can get a better rate. The banks have to be quantity setters and price takers, lending in that kind of a wholesale market. Uh, and just like in the um, circuit approach, the horizontalists always have emphasized that loan making is closely related to the wage bill. Because what commercial banks uh, traditionally do is they make short term loans to firms to finance the wage bill. Um, a mini critique is that increasingly this leaves out the vast majority of financial activity. The vast majority of financial activity has nothing to do with production. It has nothing to do with the wage bill. So when you're talking about anything but the very smallest banks, they're not financing commercial activity like this. Okay. They are uh, involved in financial markets that we call financialization. So that's what they do. They don't make loans for the wage bill. Horizontalist. Both reserves and the money supply are horizontal. I didn't draw the picture, I don't think. No, I didn't. So let me just explain that. This was the picture of the supply of loans, which essentially is the lending. If I drew the supply of reserves, not supply of money, okay, so just relabel this as reserves, that would be horizontal at the Fed funds rate. The supply of reserves is also horizontal because the central bank stands ready to supply all the reserves necessary to hit its Fed funds target. Okay, so it's not going to allow the Fed funds rate to be pushed up or below except in unusual times like quantitative easing when they were happy to let it go down to zero. So normally they will have to supply reserves in order to hit that target. So we can think of reserves as also being a horizontal supply. All right, that led to some debate. Um, when when we draw a horizontal supply curve, we're talking about a perfectly elastic curve. This implies that banks will make an infinite quantity of loans at that interest rate, the Fed funds rate plus a markup, right? This is infinitely elastic. They'll make an infinite quantity of loans at this interest rate. Now, to be fair, Basil Moore argued that over the course of the cycle, banks might start getting worried about credit risk and they will adjust the markup. If they start to think, you know, things are getting risky, they'll increase the markup and the curve will shift up. It'll still be horizontal, all right, but it's not fixed. When they're really optimistic, they reduce the markup because they don't worry about defaults, it could shift down. So the curve can shift around, but it's always horizontal. That's the way that it's envisioned by the horizontalists. Um, okay, that, that's what I just talked about, revision of expectations. Um, <coughs> already talked about the retail and wholesale, yeah. So it, this then sparked debates in the early 90s. Um, and uh, Tom Pally and um, Bob um, Poland uh, wrote critiques and they came up with this other approach that they call structuralist. Okay, it's in the JPKE if you're interested in the 90s. Um, and they raised a series of arguments against this view of horizontal money supply and horizontal reserves. Uh, reserves are not horizontal uh, because the central bank uses both price and quantity constraints. 
So they argued that uh, the central bank actually does not stand ready to supply reserves at the Fed funds rate target. What they will do is use quantity constraints. I don't want to go too much into the details. If you're really interested, you, you can read it. It turns out, I think, this was all completely mistaken. Um, the central banks can supply reserves in open market operations. They can also supply them at the window, discount window. And it is true that the, the Fed could choose to supply less in open market operations, and that forces the banks to go to the window. Okay? Uh, and the idea is banks really don't want to go to the discount window because if you go to the discount window, the Fed might uh, discriminate against you. And so they're frown costs. How do they discriminate? Well, they say, you know, we really want to look very closely at your books. And so banks fear this. They don't want to do it. And so it's not equivalent. Borrowing at the discount window is not equivalent to open market operations. Uh, the, when the central bank uses quantity constraints, which it, it claimed it was doing un, under Volcker, so all of that monetarist experiment period, the central bank was supposedly using quantity constraints, and those spur innovations. And uh, both of them, Pally and uh, Poland, were looking back to early work by Minsky in the 50s in which he, he talked about how if central bank tries to constrain money growth, banks will innovate and get around constraints. So it was important to Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, so they were invoking that. Uh, those innovations stretch liquidity, uh, can increase fragility, so we should think of the money supply curve as being upward sloping. And if you read Minsky, 1957, uh, Rusius, 1957, they both had articles that sound like an upward sloping money supply curve, okay? And so uh, these guys are referring to that. Well, the, and then they have some econometric work that purports to show that um, uh, the supply curves are not horizontal, okay? Uh, Basil Moore responded to those, and so if you read their critiques, you really need to read his response because it's very good. Uh, even though I have objections too, his, res his response uh, is, I think, right on the money. That uh, first, the econometric is very poorly done, which is not surprising because virtually all macroeconomic econometrics is very poorly done. Um, there's not enough data, not enough data points. And the same problem I was talking about here, it's, you can't identify the curves you're trying to identify. So. The um, uh, other thing is he um, argued that this really isn't changing any argument. Okay, so maybe there are additional costs on the bank. They might have to increase their markup to cover those frown costs. But we still, it's better to conceive of it as being horizontal. And then finally, when you're talking about innovations uh, you know, occur over time in reaction to constraints the central bank is trying to uh, talk to you, uh, trying to uh, uh, constrain you, you are not talking about demand and supply. Because when I draw a picture like that, it's a point in time. It's not what can happen over time. So when Basil Moore draws his picture, this is at a point in time. This is what it looks like. And innovation could cause this curve to shift up or down. But at a point in time, okay, he's drawing it as horizontal. The things that they're talking about occur over months or years. It's a completely different time horizon from what he, and what Minsky was talking about. It's a completely different time horizon than what uh, Basil Moore is talking about here. So conceptually, they're on completely different planes when they're arguing. So their arguments are completely irrelevant to what he was doing. Anyway, this, this continued on uh, for quite a while. There were even some Brazilians who got involved in this argument. 
But I think they were talking past each other. They were not talking about the same thing at all. Okay. Um, Rusius, who I mentioned, uh, has some other work. He has a very nice uh, post-Keynesian monetary uh, theory book, too. Um, said that we should uh, return to Keynes of the treaties if we want to do monetary theory instead of Keynes of the general theory, where Keynes said all the monetary details fall into the background. I, I already did it in the treaties, I'm not going to do it again. Okay, so you need to go back to the treaties. And in the treaties, Keynes talked about um, two spheres of circulation. <laughs> Everything I've been talking about so far has been about, you know, what we call the real sector, right? It's about where the production goes on. But we also have a financial sphere. And these two things are not, clo not necessarily closely related. They could be closely related, but they're not. Okay? And increasingly, the financial sphere is more and more separate. Okay? He, he started arguing this a very long time ago, before everyone talked about financialization. But, uh, and, and Keynes was worried about it too. But today, they, they're almost entirely different spheres, and most of the financial instruments that are being created have to do with financialization, not about financing production. And so, if you ignore that and just focus on production, you're only capturing a very, very small part of the financial system. So that's the point he was making, and um, he goes on to argue that um, if the financial sphere is so much more profitable than the productive sphere, everyone's attention will go to the financial sphere, which is what we see in the brain. And when I get to Minsky a bit later, talking about the rise of money manager capitalism, that's what it's all about. It's all about the financial sector. The sector is very much more profitable. That's why. Uh, General Motors, General Electric, everybody had their own bank. That is where most of their profits came from. Okay, so they're making cars, but they don't make any profits on the cars. They make profits on the finance. In the beginning, the finance was related to the cars. They gave you the loan so you could buy the car. They could sell you the car with no profit at all. They made their profits on lending you money to buy the car. But then they said, well, hold it, but there's also lots of money to be made making home mortgage loans, which have nothing to do with building cars. So then they get into mortgage lending and then everything else, every other crazy thing that all the uh, banks were doing. They're doing the same stuff. Okay, well, that's just an example of what he's talking about. Um, so uh, finally, uh, resolution. Uh, I think it is useful to think of reserves as being horizontal. So the central banks set a target, and normally uh, they want to supply the quantity of reserves banks want in order to hit their target. Um, so this is strictly true if they don't pay interest on reserves and they don't want to Then they've got to supply the quantity of reserves banks want. If they're willing to have SERP, they can supply extra. If they pay interest on reserves, then they can supply extra, and the interest on reserves will be the going interest rate. Whatever they pay on reserves, that will be the base rate. So effectively, that becomes their target. Um, we we uh, should accept endogenous money, and everyone does now. However, we shouldn't throw out liquidity preference. The, the, the horizontalists argue that the interest rate is exogenous. It's determined by the central bank. You know, that's strictly speaking, that's the overnight interest rate. So they determine the bank rate or Fed funds rate, but then banks determine the rate, the rate that they pay on deposits and the, as a mark down below that and the rate that they charge on loans as a markup above that. So we still think of it as being exogenous, determined by the central bank, all right? And so Basil Moore, uh, Mark Lavoie, uh, Louis-Philippe Rouchon, all argue 
we have to throw out liquidity preference. Because Keynes presented liquidity preference as the theory of interest rate determination. Well, if interest rates are determined by the central bank, and then with just a mark up and a mark down, they're not determined by liquidity preference. So they argue that liquidity preference was only consistent with that vertical money supply curve and downward sloping money demand curve. Okay, so we have to throw it out. Uh, Mark Lavoie wrote uh, a paper, I think in '85, uh, saying uh, post Keynesians can no longer accept liquidity preference. We have to throw that out of the theory. And he's moderated a tiny bit, but whenever he sends me a paper and says, "See, we're close," we're miles apart. Uh, liquidity preference theory is the central piece of the general theory. That's the fundamental Keynesian of, uh, argument. I accept that. Chapter 17 is by far the most important part, the most important piece of the general theory, and it's all about liquidity. So how do we resolve that? Central banks do set the overnight target, but the other interest rates are very complexly determined. They're very complexly determined. Liquidity preference plays a role in determining those rates. It's not the only factor. So, for example, if you ask Basil Moore, okay, your story, uh, I can see how the central bank sets the bank rate, and then there's a markup or markdown for short-term rates. What determines the long-term rate? say the 10-year rate, the 30-year rate, Basil Moore's response will be, well, it's expectations of future central bank policy. That's the expectations theory. I admit that the expectations theory does play a role. Okay, so that with, when the central bank starts telling you, hey, we're gonna raise interest rates eventually, that's going to affect your expectations and it will have some influence on the overnight rate. Every time the, the Fed came out with an announcement, you would see the, the rates could move. It didn't last long, okay? When the rate hike doesn't come, whatever little bump there was, it falls back down. So expectations play some role, but they don't really explain long-term rates. Um, there's another theory, habitat theory, that is, if you have lots of long-term bonds and the market wants short-term bonds, you're going to have to pay high rates on those long-term bonds to get the market to hold that, and vice versa. So the um, sort of the, the composition of the, the terms of the bonds will influence the long-term rates. And that also, I think, is partially the story. But there still is room for liquidity credit, so we shouldn't be throwing that out. I'm going to come back to liquidity in a second. Um, I already talked about the story of innovations. I, Minsky was right in pointing out that whenever central banks try to constrain in any way, if they try to uh, regulate interest rates, for example, which we did in the US for a long time, the banks will innovate and try to get around that. Anytime the central bank imposes any kind of constraint on a financial institution, they immediately start trying to get around it, okay? So that's absolutely true. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with that part of the structuralist argument, it just wasn't a good critique of horizontalism. Um, I'll, I'll be coming back to this. Uh, the reason why liquidity preference is so important to Keynes' argument is that Keynes argued if we didn't have money or a highly liquid substitute, we wouldn't have unemployment. Money is the cause of unemployment. Okay. It is the preference for liquidity that prevents us from achieving full employment. So his whole story of insufficient aggregate demand is based on special properties of money that he presents in chapter 17. These special properties of money make it the most liquid thing there is, normally. 
question about hyperinflation yesterday. In a hyperinflation, money might lose its special properties, and you will move to something else. Uh, Keynes said possibly land. Now, in reality, what do you move to? U.S. dollars. So you always have that out there, and that is, that will be the thing that people want to do today, not land or anything else, not gold. They're going to run to dollars. But he did raise the possibility that it could be something else that would be the most liquid thing. Um, so if you throw out liquidity and preference there, you're throwing out the theory of effective demand. You're throwing out Keynes's explanation for why we have unemployment. You have no theory of unemployment. Okay? Uh, if you adopt this perspective. So that's why it's so important. And then finally, you notice the circuit approach, they had a central bank, but no government. I said they partially remedied that. Basil Moore, central bank, no government. The, the endogenous money story up to 1990, there's no government in there. You can look in Basil Moore's 1988 book, I did it. Uh, look in the index for taxes. Nothing. No entry. Okay? There's no discussion of how the government really spends. Zero. There's no discussion of the impact of fiscal policy on bank reserves. Zero. No discussion. And fiscal policy's impacts on reserves is far greater than the central banks, normally. If you think about uh, the United States, before the global financial crisis, the total quantity of reserves in the banking system was $50 billion. $50 billion. Now, it got up to $4 trillion because of QE, but $50 billion. $50 billion of reserves was enough to satisfy the bank demand for reserves. Okay? The budget deficit could reach $500 billion in a year. It reached a trillion dollars when the global financial crisis hit. I already mentioned it. I'm going to go into it in more detail. Uh, dollar for dollar, a budget deficit adds reserves. If a budget deficit is 500 billion for the year, it added 500 billion of reserves to the banking system. That's 10 times what banks want. The impact of fiscal policy on bank reserves is huge. No discussion whatsoever in Basel's book, or by any post keynesian until we started developing modern money theory. So they're leaving out the most important actor in the economy and the monetary system, which is actually the treasury, not the central bank. Uh, the central bank is the agent of the treasury. Um, so it's going to go through the central bank, but it's not their policy. They're just doing what the Treasury tells them to do. It was completely left out of post-Keynesian um, thought, and pretty much left out of all uh, orthodoxy, the impacts of that on the monetary system. The textbooks always, you know, they have a chapter, here's monetary policy, here's fiscal policy, no link between the two whatsoever. There's never any link, they're completely separate conceptually. When they talk about the government spending, they never told you how the government spends. They said the government spends. Okay. Where did the government get the money? Well, they say tax revenue, but that can't be. Logically, cannot be true. You can't pay your taxes till the government spends. Okay. Just like you can't save until firms invest. That's the logic of the Keynesian system. Okay, uh, I just took a few slides out that aren't essential and they're sort of self-explanatory, so they'll be in a longer version um, that I guess is available. But I won't do that so that we can try to get done, have time for question and answer. So again, I gave you sheared to read so you can see that even the mainstream accepts the uh, main points that where the heterodox economists are making. Um, 
reserves or the liability of the central bank. They can't run out. They can always supply more if they're needed. <coughs> um, the banks can't lend those reserves on to anyone other than banks that have accounts at the central bank. Uh, why is he pointing that out? Why am I pointing it out? Because the um, dialogue about quantitative easing was that, well, banks aren't lending to firms. So what we're going to do is we're going to give them reserves so they can make the loans. They can lend on the reserves to firms. Well, they can't do that. They can only lend reserves to other banks. Okay? And other banks didn't want to borrow the reserves. So there's nothing they could do with them. They just sit there with reserves. Okay? It's not going to stimulate any lending. The only thing that quantitative easing did was it slightly reduced the profitability of banks. That's what it does. Because you're taking government bonds that maybe earn 4% interest or more, taking those off their balance sheet, giving them reserves they were earning 25 basis points, 0.25. Okay, so they lost revenue. <clears throat> That's all the quantitative easing did. There's no reason to believe that would stimulate the economy. It doesn't. Um, can reserves get out of the banking system? Uh, no, except with one caveat. The only way the reserves can get out of the banking system is if you withdraw cash. That's the only way that bank reserves uh, are reduced. Okay, otherwise, they stay in the banking system. So that's why we still have about three trillion, I think it is, in the uh, U.S. banking system. They can't get out. They can't lend them to anyone other than other banks, so they can't get out. What happens if banks have more reserves than they want? Well, first they offer them in the overnight market, but eventually you're going to push the overnight rate down to uh, what we'll call the support rate. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the U.S. before the crisis never had a support rate. So what would happen with excess reserves is you drove the interest rate to zero. That's where it would go. Okay. In countries that had a support rate, it would only fall to the support rate. What if banks are short reserves? Uh, well, they can't manufacture them themselves, so if they're short reserves, they have to first go to the uh, overnight market, if other banks don't have reserves to lend them, then they have to go to the central bank. That's what they say. So he deals with all of these questions, and he, um, that paper answers them all the same way that I would. So there's really no difference of opinion on this. Uh, so the way we should view banks is not the way the Orthodox <coughs> tell the story. Banks sit around, wait for a deposit that creates x rays reserves, and they can lend up multiple times the amount of excess reserves they have. That's not the way that it works. What banks actually do is they make loans, and then if they need reserves, they get them afterwards. The loan officers don't even know whether the banks have excess reserves or are short reserves at the time they make the loan. They don't care. Completely irrelevant. It's not their job. Okay? The bank will have a reserve officer who makes sure that uh, they get the reserves they need to clear, and in the United States, we have a required reserve ratio. Okay, not all countries have that, but we have that, so they have to have the quantity of reserves that are required, but those are calculated after the fact in a very complicated way. So you don't actually have to be meeting the required reserve ratio when you're making the loans. It's calculated about six weeks later. Okay. And so what you do, you do the calculation, you find out you're short, you have two days to get enough reserves to raise your average up to what was required. That's what they do. So a reserve officer does that for them. Um, almost all central banks operate with an explicit overnight rate target, supply reserves on demand, and make sure they get paid. Providing more reserves than they want will not increase bank and supplying fewer than uh, banks want will just cause the central bank to miss its turn. So there's no sense in doing that. The heterodox view of the deposit multiplier is that it's a myth. That's not the way the banks work. Uh, Paul, 
Krugman still believes we, we've had an argument with them in uh, his column, and uh, the commentators will jump all over and tell me he doesn't have the slightest idea what he's talking about, which is true. He has no idea. He still believes in the bottom of the uh, notion. But to be fair, that's not his area of expertise. He does trade theory. Maybe he's good at trade theory. I have no idea. He's terrible at macroeconomics. He doesn't understand. Uh, much of anything about it. And he definitely doesn't understand how simple it is. Um, so let me skip all of that. Uh, when a bank accepts a borrower's IOU, it creates a demand deposit. So that's how loans are made. Uh, it's not through any deposit multiplier, it's through a keystroke. Uh, there's no raw material that's required. They don't need reserves to make loans. Their reserves are not the raw material that allows you to produce loans. It's just a keystroke a credit to someone's bank account. All right, uh, this is the way that uh, I began uh, presenting an alternative to uh, the verticalist, which is the orthodox with the fixed money supply, and the horizontalist, which is Basil Moore. Okay, and you'll see it has both a vertical and a horizontal. But it brings in the government. It brings in the treasury. So that's completely left out of Basil Moore's horizontal story. So just quickly, when the treasury spend, HPM stands for high powered money. Okay, this is what Minsky always used, high powered money, so it's the way that I learned it, instead of calling it the monetary base, which is the way most people learn it, I suppose. Uh, HPM is also Minsky's initials, which made me why he liked that. Uh, so anyway, it's the monetary base. That is reserves plus cash. Okay, cash is completely determined by the public. You can always get more cash if you want to go to the ATM machine. So that's completely, uh, so supplied completely at the demand of the public. All right. Um, treasury spending leads to credits to banks' reserves. Okay, so that's why there's an arrow coming in. That is a supply of reserves. And as I was saying, usually that will be far more important than the supply of reserves that come from the Fed. The Fed supplies reserves in open market operations and at the discount window. But far more reserves are supplied by treasury spending than by Fed lending or open market purchases in normal times. Quantitative easing was huge. But until QE, Fed never did things like that. So Basil Moore focuses only on this one, but far more reserves come this way into the system. Okay? <laughs> High powered money gets out of the system when you pay taxes. When you pay taxes, your bank's reserves are debited, dollar for dollar. So if the flow in is bigger than the flow out, if government spending is bigger than taxes, you net add reserves to the banking system. Okay? That's actually where most reserves come from, from budget deficits, because most governments run budget deficits. That's how the majority of the reserves get into the system. Okay, in addition, they can come from the central bank. So we have an arrow coming in that way. That's the horizontal part. This is the vertical part. So it's a different kind of vertical. It's not a vertical money supply, like in the orthodox diagram, but it is a vertical injection in the system. The other way that high-powered money gets out of the system is, in through, is through bond sales. The bond sales are by the treasury and by the central bank. Now, of course, the central bank can only sell bonds that it bought. It can't manufacture bonds, treasury bonds. Okay? So, if the central bank has bought treasury bonds in an open market operation, if they can sell them in an open market operation and drain reserves. But really, it's only draining reserves it put in when it bought the bonds, right? Your central banks don't create treasury bonds. I, I do need to put a footnote here. There are some central banks 
that sell their own bonds. And that it typically occurs if you have a government that doesn't run budget deficits. Okay? If you have a government that doesn't run budget deficits, uh, then you don't have a supply of bonds to the system. The system likes to have government bonds, and so the central bank will sell them. Uh, bank, the Bank of China, because the government, national government of China typically runs a budget surplus, the Bank of China supplies the bonds that the system wants. Okay? So that's a little footnote. doesn't apply to the United States, to the UK, to Japan, you know, to most developed capitalist countries where the guns run budget deficits. All right, now I said there was one contribution by modern money theory that was new, where you, you do not find it until modern money theory. Every other idea that we have that is comprised of modern money theory, I think you can find it. Uh, someone else already expressed it, somewhere. A lot of the ideas you can find expressed 200 years ago. So they're definitely not new. They're very old ideas. Uh, the, um, the, the views of uh, government spending, those are very old ideas. Okay? But there is one that I don't think you will find anyone ever expressed it before. And that is Warren Mosley who was a, a hedge fund manager and he dealt in government bonds. And he was sitting there, I, I think in the early 80s, and he was saying, you know, when the um, central bank, the Fed, sells bonds, we call that a monetary policy operation. When the treasury sells bonds, we call that borrowing. And he thought to himself, but they have exactly the same impact. There is no difference in the functional impact of the central bank selling bonds or the treasury selling bonds. What's the functional impact? They drain reserves out of the banking system. So he said, both of those really are monetary policy. Whether the treasury sells bonds, or the Fed sells bonds, it's monetary policy. It has nothing to do with borrowing. Selling bonds is not a borrowing operation. It is a monetary policy operation designed to drain reserves. Okay. So he called it IRMA, I-R-M-A, an interest rate maintenance account. Government bonds are an interest rate maintenance account. Why do you sell them? You sell them to get excess reserves out of the banks so that the interest rate doesn't fall. That's the purpose of bonds. No one had ever put it this way before. When, when I first heard Warren say it, you know, we were agreeing on lots of things, and then he said that. I said, wait a minute. Okay, that's bizarre. It's not a borrowing operation at all. It's an interest rate maintenance operation. But I knew the... Uh, accounting, the T accounts, and I knew that what he said was right, because I had done it as a student. Uh, I had a, a particular teacher, a guy named John Randlett, who insisted we spend hour after hour after hour doing the accounting of everything you could possibly do accounting for. And we had done the accounting of that, and it was true, that that's what happens when the Treasury sells bonds. Bank reserves go down. So I knew that that was right. And uh, I think that is new. People, I mean, Randlett knew, of course, that selling bonds was removing reserves, but he still called bond sales borrowing when the Treasury did it. But it's not borrowing at all. Treasuries don't borrow their own currency, they can't do it. Now, your government can issue foreign currency denominated bonds, and we call that borrowing. Okay? Brazil cannot create dollars. So if your government issues bonds denominated in dollars, I'm perfectly fine with calling that borrowing. Okay, it's not your currency. But you can't borrow your own currency. That's nonsensical. 
That would be like you writing an IOU to your neighbor and then trying to borrow it from them. Would that make any sense? Borrowing your own IOU. It's nonsensical. Okay. You actually can't show me a balance sheet that makes any sense where you're borrowing your own IOUs. So you can't show a treasury balance sheet that makes any sense where the treasury is borrowing its own currency. That's not what is going on. They, they can sell bonds for their own currency, but it's not borrowing. They had to put the currency there first. The reserves have to get into the banks before they can buy the bonds. There's no other way for them to buy them because the only thing that is accepted here when the Fed or Treasury sells bonds, the only thing they accept is reserves. That's it. It's they debit your reserves. Okay, so the reserves have to get in there first. The spending already occurred to get the reserves in the system or the lending. There had to be spending or lending for the banks to get the reserves they used to buy the bonds. So you can't call that a borrowing operation. All it does is change their portfolio. Instead of reserves, they have bonds. Okay? Then there's another uh, continuing horizontal part. Banks create M1, M2 when they make loans or when they buy other kinds of financial assets. We can call that a leveraging. Leveraging isn't the same thing as a money multiplier. It just means that they have to have, either have reserves or access to reserves when they make loans and create deposits. Why? Because they have to clear with other banks. So they're going to have to have reserves or have access to reserves in order to clear with other banks. So we can think of that as a leveraging. I mean, this is using the term leverage, this is the way it's always used in financial markets. Right? You're leveraging the reserves you have or the reserves that you think you have. Um, yeah, that pretty much is all of that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure you made it right, but it seems like when the government or whatever the fan is trading, when they're buying back bonds, doesn't that mean some sort of, it's such an idea of the economy, meaning of money? Because they're actually acting on the Well, if they didn't care what the interest rate impact was. Okay? They are doing it, that's why it's called IRMA, Interest Rate Maintenance Account. They are doing it because they do care what the interest rate is. So they are endogenously reacting to the impacts of fiscal policy on interest rates. Okay. However, the interest rate target itself, you could say, is exogenous in the control sense. Is it exogenous in the theoretical sense? No. Okay, why? Because the interest rates are set with respect to <coughs> goals for the economy, right? Generally, anti-inflation. So if, there's in, if, if they perceive inflation pressure, what do they do? They raise the rate. It's an exogenous in the control sense. They decided to do it. They didn't have to do it, right? So it's exogenous. But it's endogenous in the theoretical sense. Because the economy was producing inflation, they decided they have to raise the rate. So it's endogenous in the theoretical sense. That's why it's important to make that distinction. You have to be clear the way you're using the term. Or using it in the control sense, usually that is what people are doing. Or are you talking about the theoretical sense? Okay? Um, so the central bank uh, sets a Fed funds rate target. Now, w when the Fed started, pre started reacting to the global financial crisis and preparing for uh, what became called quantitative easing, they realized they were going to have a problem. If they put excess reserves in the banks, they're going to drive the interest rate to zero. 
And banks are going to sit there with an asset that earns nothing. Okay, that's not good for banks. And so they went to Congress, the Fed went to Congress, and said, we want permission to pay interest on reserves. They had never been allowed to do this. Congress was opposed to it. Now, why the U.S. has very interesting banking history. Generally speaking, uh, Congress has been anti-banks. Okay? Now, of course, not the New York representatives, uh, the East Coast representatives, but the whole Midwest has never trusted banks. And so the Fed was not allowed to pay interest on banks because everyone sees that that's a subsidy to the banks. Why would you do that? Okay, you don't have to pay them interest. Why would you do it? The banks, of course, have always wanted interest on reserves. They say, you make us hold reserves, you should pay us interest on those. The Fed couldn't do it. The Fed went to Congress, Congress always said no, you can't do it. This time they said yes. So they started paying interest on reserves. The Fed wasn't the first one to do this. Canada had adopted this same system in the uh, uh, mid-90s. Okay, as I, I was writing Understanding Modern Money, so I put it in that book. I said, yeah, this is the way simple banks ought to operate. So the Canadians got there before us. Maybe they were the first in the world, I don't know. But they adopted um, what I think is probably the best way to do it. So what they do is they pay interest on reserves. Uh, and say uh, the, the target that you want minus some basis points. So let's say you're trying to hit a target of 50 basis points, then you pay 25 basis points on reserves. When banks are short, they borrow. You charge the target rate plus a premium. So you add 25 basis points to the target to get the discount rate. So you charge 75 basis points, you pay 25 basis points, the, target, the interest rate will remain within that target range. Okay, so that's what we've done ever since. We still do it that way. And we most likely will continue to do it that way. Now Canada is different from the United States because we have a required reserve ratio. Canada, uh, the Canadian Central Bank, tells banks aim for zero. Okay, aim for zero reserves. End each day with no reserves. In the United States, the banks have to end each day with positive reserves. Okay. Now, if you have banks end with zero reserves, that means you have to lend on demand all the time which is what they do. They just offer overdraft facilities. You don't even have to go to the central bank and say, hey, we need to borrow reserves. When you're ch clearing checks, they automatically lend you the reserves. So they operate what's called overdraft. So banks just use overdrafts, okay? The most sensible thing to do. Why require reserves? You just lend them as they need them for clearing purposes. When you do it the Bank of Canada's way, you can hit your target exactly all the time. The problem with the US is we have a band and the rate will fluctuate mostly in the band. Then for technical reasons, they can go outside the band. They can go above and below both. So our system is less efficient at actually hitting the target that you want, okay? Canada hits theirs uh, because they just automatically credit at uh, the target rate. Okay, so anyway, this is an important point. Most people still, even though most of what I'm saying has is, is become accepted, some, most people still misunderstand something. If the central bank wants to, let's say, raise its target, most people think the central bank has to go into the market and take reserves out to put pressure on banks who will bid the rate up. Or if they want the rate to go down, they gotta put reserves in the system and push the rate down. Okay, that's not true. That used to be true in the United States up until 1994. The reason is because the Fed never told the banks what the target was. Okay, so if 
you probably aren't familiar with the way that it worked, but the, there's FOMC meeting almost once per month. And at the, it goes for two days, and at 2 p.m. on the second day, the, the meeting is supposedly closed. Actually, we know a lot more about this now. There's lots of people in these meetings. Some of them have been um, uh, releasing illegally confidential information to favored banks. Huge scale. But anyway, the idea was, you know, it's a closed meeting, nobody knows what's going on there. 2 p.m., uh, someone is designated from the uh, FOMC or their staff to pick up the phone, next door all the reporters are sitting there, and they read a statement. And the statement would say something like, you know, given the uh, outlook for inflation and unemployment um, and economic growth, the Fed has decided to slightly increase pressure on money markets. Okay, what does it mean? So this, this is all the reporters know, and so they all busily write it up and it goes in the, into the press. And then the banks have to interpret what does it mean? Increase interest rates by how much? Don't know. Okay, so banks start to anticipate that the Fed is going to be pushing rates up, but they don't know how high, so they have, to, they have to sort of test it, and it will go up, and finally it goes up enough, and the Fed intervenes. Okay, and then it's pushed down. And then it goes down and down, because there's, they're trying to find where it's gonna settle, and the Fed intervenes, pushes it up. Okay, and so it goes like this, and the fluctuation gets smaller and smaller, and it gets closer to what people assume must be the target. So that's why the Fed actually had to do something. Okay, in 1994, well, this is a fun story. But I'll try to make it shorter. Greenspan was caught lying to Congress. Uh, there was a particular uh, representative from Texas, Henry Gonzalez, who was the head of the uh, 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 Congressional um, Banking Committee, the House uh, Banking Committee, and he had heard uh, two rumors. One, information was getting out to favored market participants. And two, that uh, the uh, Fed taped all of the meetings. Okay, now we had Watergate, and, uh, President Nixon had taped all the meetings. In 1994, there was this rumor that the Fed had taped all the meetings. So, Greenspan was called before Congress, Gonzalez is grilling him and asking him, uh, do you have recordings of all the meetings? Greenspan says no. no. Greenspan goes back, we know all this now, because uh, we have the transcripts. He, he calls up all of the FOMC, they get a conference phone call, and he tells them, uh, I didn't quite tell the truth, and each one of you is going to have to decide whether you, because you're all going to be called in. Each one of you will have to decide for yourself if you're going to tell the truth or not. Lying to Congress, you can go to prison. Okay? You cannot do this. And so he went back and said, you know, I didn't quite, uh, I wasn't quite forthcoming. <laughs> we tape every meeting. <laughs> then we transcribe them. And then we record over the tape. We use the same tape for the next meeting. Okay? So we have all the transcripts, okay, all the way back to the Nixon days. And um, so then there's great pressure on the Fed to release those. Now they're all released with a five-year lag. So we can read the transcripts, we know what they're saying. In the and uh, Greenspan goes back to the FOMC and he says, you know, we better be more transparent. <laughs> and so from that time on, they announce what the target is. So now at 2 p.m., they tell you what the target will be. So we no longer have to do anything at all. It immediately goes to the target because no bank is going to bet that the Fed can't hit its target. Right? If you're lending below or borrowing above, okay, you're crazy because you know what the target is going to be. So it immediately goes there with no action whatsoever. All right, uh, getting near the end. Uh, liquidity, did I give this paper read? Cramp? 
I think I did. No? This one? Yeah. No? Oh. 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 All right. Uh, I want to explain the pyramid. So, Cramp has a new Palgrave entry. You know, the new Palgrave Dictionary of Economics. The original one, 1960, he had a, an entry on liquidity. Um, and it says uh, three main characteristics. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to talk about liquidity preference. Um, maturity, currency has zero life to maturity, so that's a very typical definition. That's why currency is the most liquid thing. It's mature, immediate, that's why it's called currency. That's where the term comes from. It's current. Um, easiness, the ratio of money to GDP. So this is liquidity of the economy as a whole. The, the more money you have relative to GDP, the more liquid the economy is. And financial strength, the strength of the balance sheets. Few liabilities relative to your prospective income flows. Um, and lots of government liabilities as assets relative to, to your IOUs because government liabilities are more liquid than uh, private liabilities. So those are three measures of liquidity. And uh, when you think of a pyramid, Minsky had this idea, Duncan Foley has a, a paper on the pyramid. Um, I think it was always inverted the other way around. This is the way that uh, I did it. Um, and uh, Stephanie Kelton, Stephanie Bell, has an article on this uh, around 2000 on the pyramid. So anyway, we can think of government liabilities are at the top. They're the most liquid thing there is by these uh, characteristics that I went through. Bank and financial institution deposit liabilities. Uh, demand deposits are immediately mature too. Savings deposits uh, in the United States, technically, those mature in 30 days. Banks don't invoke that. They allow you to withdraw immediately without a penalty, but they can invoke it if they want to. Uh, they can require 30 days notice. Certificates of deposit, typically 90 days, so there's a less than so non-deposit liabilities um, are less liquid than the deposit liabilities. Short-term liabilities of non-financial institutions, and then households and small business liabilities. These are just general guidelines. There could be exceptions to themselves. And it's increasingly hard to tell the difference between a financial institution and a non-financial institution. Although the GE and GM both learn lessons from global financial crisis, they don't want to be banks anymore. They shed a lot of that. GE continues to shed things, I'm trying to get back to what they used to do. So I think in this pyramid, the liquidity declines as we move down. Uh, convertibility, I didn't mention that. Typically, you have to convert your own liabilities into liabilities that are higher in the pyramid. Um, and when you uh, make payments, generally you use liabilities that are higher. So banks make payments to each other using the central bank's liabilities. Firms make payments to each other using bank liabilities. Okay, and households also use uh, higher liabilities. Financial innovation, uh, money things or money records from yesterday when I was talking about this, provides a very broad definition of uh, money. Anyone can create money, as he says. Okay, well, that's very, very broad. If you can write IOU and get someone to accept it, Minsky would call that money. So it's a very broad definition. Most economists focus on a narrow definition. Orthodox and a lot of post-Keynesians argue that banks can create money, but other kinds of financial institutions cannot. So this has become a big issue. Uh, a, a lot of people after the global financial crisis were arguing that um, the rise of shadow banks, so people finally recognize that that have, had happened, they argue that 
those institutions cannot create money. Only banks can. Okay? And this will not hold up. You can use shadow bank liabilities for virtually anything that you can use uh, chartered bank liabilities for. The shadow banks can create money that you can use as a means of payment, that you can use as a medium of exchange. Okay? So, um, we shouldn't make a sharp distinction between these. Uh, there are distinctions, but it's not that. They can create money liabilities, just as the banks can. Now, the difference is, they don't have direct access to the Fed. So when things go bad, okay, they can't turn to the Fed. Chartered banks can. So in a crisis, it does make a difference in how things are handled. In the US, it's obvious. The Fed has the authority to lend reserves to any chartered bank. Okay? Basically, under any condition whatsoever, they can lend to a chartered bank. So there's no problem dealing with the crisis with chartered banks. It becomes a lot more iffy when it is the shadow banks that are in trouble, whether the Fed can lend to them. Okay, the Fed had to invoke special conditions to lend to them, and probably most of their lending actually was illegal. They actually did not have the authority to do that. Uh, so there are distinctions, but it's not in their ability to create money. Okay, conclusion, no sharp dividing line between a money thing and a debt thing. Okay, this is my view, this is the modern money view. This is not shared by all heterodox people. It's not shared by Graziani, for example. He doesn't agree with this. Uh, for him, banks are special in creating money. No, no one else can create money. He would not agree that a money market mutual fund, which is not a bank, can create money. Money market mutual funds did not have access to that. They did not have deposit insurance. All IOUs are redeemable. I talked about what I mean by that term yesterday, and accepted in payments of debts held by the issuer. Only some IOUs can be used directly in payment to, to others. IOUs have varying degrees of liquidity, and banks act as intermediaries in many of the IOU transactions. That is to say, money, a money market mutual fund is usually going to have a relation with a chartered bank to make payments that have to be made um, using the central bank's pouch. So that's how they handle that. Nothing new about that. If you go back to uh, England, before the Bank of England, the uh, country banks used the city banks, the London banks, to make payments for each other. And then when the central bank came in, the country banks didn't need to have accounts at the uh, Bank of England. That accounts at London banks. The London banks could make the payments, continue to make the payments for them, even using Bank of England liabilities. Uh, and that is still done in the US too. So banks down in the Midwest will have accounts at uh, Chase and use Chase to make some payments. Yeah, that was it. The appendix has balance sheets, so it has a typical bank balance sheet, typical central bank balance sheet. Then it shows you how you do the accounting when the bank makes a loan to buy a car, and uh, oh, when the government spends, how you do the balance sheets. So I'll let you do that. And just take questions. As many as you want. What about what about 
I mean, the implications of an ever-growing uh, government that goes to that like every year, on and on, infinitely. Like the U.S. Yeah. But, so, <laughs> so, what are the implications of that? How does that add? Okay, uh, we'll talk a bit about this uh, in coming days. I think with, but so the orthodox answer is that uh, we can sort of set up the math and we can solve it and the answer always comes out to be approximately the same okay? and that is that if the um, interest rate on the government debt is above the growth rate of GDP the debt ratio will explode that's what happens so the debt ratio will explode. If the interest rate on government debt is below the growth rate, it will converge. It won't explode. Okay? So it will converge to some uh, less than infinite number. Right? Uh, and then, it, then the argument is, therefore, well, you, you couldn't have the debt ratio exploding to infinity. You can't do that. So that is why they say that it's unsustainable, okay? So if you look at most uh, countries uh, today, well, the growth rates are pretty miserably low, okay? Typically 2%, something like that. Now, the developing world, I know, uh, has exceptions to this, but if you look at the developed world, 2 2.5% is about what we grow at. The, the interest rate is typically higher than that, the interest rate the government is paying on its debt. Therefore, it's unsustainable. So that's how they reach that conclusion. It's a, a very simple math exercise. You can read uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt, uh, uh, all the scary stuff, or in the US, Kotlikoff is the best, uses this to demonstrate that we're on an unsustainable path. So that's the orthodox answer. Um, of course, th there are some people who are just, or sort of, I would just say they're nutty, who just argue you can't run deficits. Now, most orthodox economists don't say anything like that. Deficits are okay. okay. But it's got to be sustainable. All right? You have to make sure your debt ratio isn't rising over time. <clears throat> you, have, you have to eventually reach some limit. What's the limit? Well, Maastricht gives you 60%. Uh, most economists think probably you shouldn't go over 100%. Rogoff and Reinhardt find somewhere around 90%. You start having crises. Their work is complete garbage. But that's what they find in variable. Complete garbage. Uh, but anyway, so maybe it's some number like 60 to 100%. Probably most Orthodox economists think that it's okay to have a deficit, it's even okay to have a growing debt as long as you're going to converge to something like 100% or less. If it's going to be higher than that, trouble. Uh, my, my answer is that uh, theoretically there would be no problem with an infinite debt ratio. Could the government make the interest payments? Of course it can. Okay, I mean it's sort of absurd, but of course they could. It's keystrokes. If it requires an infinite number of keystrokes, they can supply it. Okay? So just as a, a technical matter, the government can always make the interest payments. Okay? Now, the whole thing is absurd. It will never go there. It can't possibly go to infinity. Okay? Nothing can. It won't. Okay, why is that? Because these, the simple mathematical exercise assumes that a bigger deficit will not increase the growth rate. And greater outstanding debt stock will not increase the growth rate. They assume the growth rate is fixed. Okay, it's nature. It's a natural growth rate. Nature fixed it. Can't be changed. Well, that's ridiculous. 
if the government deficit is, is growing and the debt ratio is growing, the growth rate is going to go up. And it's very likely you're going to get it above the interest rate. The interest rate is a policy variable. In orthodoxy, the interest rate can't be changed either. It's a natural rate, like a, from fixed cell. Okay? The, um, uh, the economy has a natural interest rate and a natural growth rate. Uh, the interest rate is a policy variable. So another solution, so one is the deficit is probably going to increase the growth rate. The other is the solution is easy. Lower the interest rate. Okay. We can lower the target to zero. We know we can, we just did it. Okay. Um, so you can lower the, that's the target rate. Now the government rate will be a bit higher, but we got the government rates, uh, even long-term rates, down to just a little bit over 2%. Well, if we can grow it two and a half, and you get the interest rate to two, it's problem solved. You will converge. Okay. Um, government doesn't have to issue long-term bonds. If the government issues thirty-day bonds, thirty-day bonds track the target rate exactly, because thirty-day bonds are perfect substitutes for reserves. You can, you, can, you can look at it yourself. You can look at your own country. The 30-day government rate will be the same as the overnight interest rate. Okay? So don't issue any long-term bonds. Just issue 30-day bonds and target the interest rate of 1% and you got 1%. All you have to do is grow faster than 1% and you convert. The debt ratio converts. Okay, or don't sell bonds at all. Don't issue any interest paying debt. Problem solved. The interest rate zero. Any growth rate that's not negative, you will have the uh, interest rate below the growth rate. Okay? So, their whole uh, vision is that the government has to borrow. Government doesn't have to borrow. Government does not borrow. The bonds are sold to keep the interest rate up. Okay? If your goal is to get the interest rate down, don't sell bonds. Don't sell them at all. Don't pay interest on reserves. Just credit reserve accounts. Okay? Now, reserves are a government debt, but they don't pay any interest. Okay? So then, without the interest payment, you, you will converge very quickly. Because what happens when the debt ratio is high is a huge part of government spending is paying interest. Don't pay any interest. Get it down to zero. Okay? And your debt ratio, then if you have any growth, your debt ratio won't converge, it will decline. So the, the solutions are really easy. If you don't want an infinite debt ratio. But even if it did go to infinity, you can always pay the interest. It's sustainable. In the uh, mathematical sense. It, they assume the economy doesn't change at all as the deficit increases. It doesn't change the economy at all. That's completely absurd. The bigger the deficit, the um, uh, greater the effect of demand, the greater the quantity of bonds in the economy, the greater the wealth. If the debt ratio is infinite, the non-government sector is infinitely wealthy. You don't think that will change their behavior? Okay. You have infinite wealth, might you consume more? So it assumes that doesn't happen. Because it assumes that the government debt is not the wealth of the private sector. It assumes that um, there is no spending multiplier, the Keynesian spending multiplier. It assumes any dollar spent by the government means a dollar not spent by the private sector. All those are ridiculous assumptions. So it, it will not happen, cannot happen. 
the debt ratio cannot continue to climb because your growth rate will go up. Now, it could be that a lot of the growth is inflation, but that's okay. That reduces the, the difficulty of servicing the debt with inflation because of the and also reduces the growth of the debt ratio relative to nominal GDP. Other questions? Yeah. In the approach, do you think there is a, a budget thing like a government budget constraint? Because government can spend. Well, the constraint is political, it's not economic. Um, up to full employment resources. Now, once you reach full employment of all resources, the government can continue to spend more. But all you're doing is taking them away from the private sector. Okay, so beyond full employment, you still could spend more, but it's probably not a good idea unless you're in a major war. So in a, in a major war, of course, you want to take the, the resources away from the private sector because you're fighting the war. You need the resources. But outside of a war, uh, generally, uh, it, it's not a good idea to take the resources away. What you want to do is employ the resources that are not being employed. So, at least up to full employment, the government should be spending more. Beyond full employment, then it depends. Do you really want to take the resources away? If so, yeah, spend more. But uh, whatever spending constraints there are, they're political. They're not economic. It's not a matter of running out of money. Yeah. Those new forms of payment, like paying with cell phones, uh, countries in Africa or Asia, is there any impact on the hierarchy of um, that instruments that you just showed us? No, not really. I mean, the same thing is with a credit card. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the credit card is not really your IOU. Mm -hmm. When you go to the grocery store and you buy groceries using a credit card, they're not accepting your IOU. They're accepting the bank's IOU, the bank that issued that credit card, okay? Now you owe the bank. Eventually you're gonna have to pay that. But uh, you're not paying the grocery store, so you're so, not in so debt with them. So even because um, paying cell phones, banks are still there? Bank, for the net clearing, there's going to be banks involved, okay? Now, uh, Let's say Apple. Apple can do a lot of the clearing strictly within Apple. If you're huge, or Walmart, they're, they're going to do the same thing. Um, they, a lot of the clearing will be within Walmart. Okay? Uh, credits and debits. Yeah, PayPal, same thing. But, but when you go across, you know, it's Apple and Walmart. Now, they're going to have a lot of um, clearing because they have claims on each other. This happens with any big bank, right? Chase and Bank of America, they do a lot of clearing just between each other. But eventually, there will be an imbalance, and the net clearing will be with the Fed. So, most of the clearing doesn't involve the Fed. Okay? There's lots of this clearing between platforms or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they can be done that way, and then the net clearing ultimately has to be the central bank because they they really are are when we say issue the currency, really it's the central bank in all the modern countries. That is where the currency comes from in the form of reserves. So they have to do the net clearing. Someone asked about Bitcoin, a completely different thing, completely different, because they're not making any promise to convert it to um, reserves. But anything, if it's denominated in, in dollars or whatever country we're talking about, it doesn't really matter whether it's um, the uh, iPhone, the credit card, the bank check, uh, ultimately the thing at the, the top of the pyramid is the same. But, uh, yeah. but somehow for the, the banking business, that changes things. Because uh, you have other layers of uh, 
yes. corporations doing the business as well. Yeah. And but they are claiming that uh, they can do that uh, on a very low cost and they compete in a more efficient way with banks. So yeah, that, that's it, already changing. Absolutely true. They, innovation, banks do a lot of innovation, but there's been a lot of innovation that hurts banks. And so, you know, who, who is getting ahead? Uh, the tables have changed many times over the past 40 years. So in the, um, uh, a lot of the innovations that uh, you're familiar with and that, that sort of led to the, the crisis were outside the commercial banks. And the, the investment banks were taking advantages and taking business away from commercial banks. So in the United States, we had very tight regulation of banks and very loose or no regulation at all to things that were not banks, including investment banks. And uh, there was a, a period where the investment banks had the huge advantage in pulling customers away Merrill Lynch pulling depositors away because they could pay higher interest. So then the banks go to Congress and they say, look, this is unfair. And, and it's true, it's unfair. So what should Congress do? First, regulate them too. No, they don't do that. They deregulate the banks. So the, this competition that really was unfair, unfair the banks are completely um, uh, on the, the right side of arguing this but the response was the wrong one. And typically that is what has happened. It, in the US, on the other hand, uh, banks go to judges in the US and they make the argument that um, the uh, federal law generally favors letting banks do anything that is closely related to banking. And so the tables really have turned and they have gotten enough rulings in their favor that they're basically able to do anything. And so they started pulling business away from the investment banks. And it was the investment banks that were at the disadvantage with the commercial banks taking away all of their business, which is why they started doing, investment banks started doing crazier and crazier and crazier stuff. Because they couldn't make a profit on what was left for them. Um, and so banks go to the, I'll just give you an example. Goldman Sachs got a bank charter. So Goldman Sachs, is a bank. The reason they got that was so they had access to federal deposit insurance in the crisis. <clears throat> they couldn't retain customers, so they were given a bank chart. Uh, Goldman Sachs goes to a judge and makes the argument that they should be allowed to buy aluminum. So says, well, how is that a bank business? We're supposed to have a separation between, you know, banking and producing real stuff. Banks aren't supposed to be doing that in production. And they said, well, you know, you allow us to be in the futures contracts in aluminum, which they were. That's why we had the commodity bubble. Goldman Sachs and others are bidding up the futures contracts. And they said, you know, uh, in order to gain more information about the aluminum market, which will help us in our futures contracts business, we should be allowed to own aluminum. Because we'll get right involved in buying and selling aluminum, that will tell us more about what's going on in those markets and we'll do a better job in the futures contracts. They win the argument. So they bought aluminum warehouses and they started holding it off the market to bid up the price of aluminum. Seriously. So it went from Budweiser would order aluminum to make cans, and these numbers aren't exactly right, but they're an order of magnitude. But, um, went from a three week delay to a year and a half delay to get aluminum, because Goldman Sachs tried to push by itself. Okay, so this is what they do, and they, they win case after case because they can make plausible arguments everything is related to banking. So there's nothing that they can be excluded from doing. So 
you know, in that sense, now the commercial, the big commercial banks are allowed to do really anything they want to do. So it's a huge problem in, in trying to keep a dividing line for regulation. You know, the, the, the other would have been just regulate everybody. If you do this, we're going to regulate you as if you were a bank, regardless of what you are, whether you have a charter or not. But that's typically not what we do. It's what Minsky always advocated. You regulate by function. If you're going to do it, you're a bank. Rather than what we used to say, used to say is that uh, if you want to be a bank, you can't do that. And to be a bank, you can do this and this, and you can't do that. That's typically what we do. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. Uh, you talked about it, but uh, could you elaborate more about uh, the consistency between exogenous interest rates and liquidity preference? Sure. Okay. The, um, the overnight rate target is exogenous in the control sense. Okay, we all agree on that now. Yes, they said it. They announced what it will be, and they said it. Okay? No question about that. The, the question is about other interest rates. Should we view those as being exogenous or not? And, my, and if they're exogenous, if they're really determined by the central bank, what role does liquidity preference play? And that's why... The horizontal said, it doesn't play any role. Throw it away. We don't need it. Okay? What I'm saying is that uh, liquidity preference theory is not a theory of the interest rate. Okay? And it, it doesn't really tell us anything about the interest rate target. It has nothing to do with that. It's uh, about the um, total return you expect to get from holding any kind of asset. That total return is uh, the uh, is what determines the interest rate. It's the the yield minus the carrying cost plus the liquidity uh, premium. So that is your total return, and that is what liquidity preference is all about. Okay, it's determining the L part of the Q minus C plus L. Liquidity preference determines that. So it goes into determining the return from any kind of asset you can hold through time. From financial assets to um, antique cars. It goes into determining the value of antique cars too. It's not the only thing that de determines their value because there's also the yield and the carrying cost. Right? And money is peculiar, Kane said, because <clears throat> its total return is from liquidity. Cash doesn't have any yield, and its carrying cost is very low. So, it return mostly comes from that. That's why it's peculiar. Talk about an um, antique car, the carrying cost is really high. Right? Uh, the, the yield could be high too, but the carrying cost is really high. And they're not that liquid. Yes, you can sell them, but you're uncertain what price, and it can take a while to to match the buyer and seller, so they're not that liquid. <laughs> so their uh, uh, L isn't much, C is really high. They need a high yield to get people to hold. If they're rational. Probably most antique collector car collectors <laughs> are not all that rational. They, they love the cars. If they make money, good. But it's viewing, uh, viewing the decision about holding assets as being a rational, not a rational expectation, but rational, which you may not always be. Any others? Okay. Tomorrow. All right. Can't remember what it is.